Hey, everybody. Hey, John. See, Chris was with us. Are you still with us, Chris? I'm here. I just turned off my video. OK. I have this weird little blue arrow next to my picture. I don't know what that means. Do you know, John? I do not. I don't see it on your on my screen. Yeah. Okay. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? Okay. A little tired tonight, but I'm okay. It's okay. So I have to wait for a few more people to show up before I start the meeting. Let's see, can you see if there's anybody else that's joining? Because so far I just see you and I. Uh oh, I can't hear you now, John. We've got Anthony and Christina. Okay. Okay, then we just need two more pair of members for a quorum. Um, I know that Tim had to go to a soccer game with his kids. Tim's joining. Okay, great. Can you share your screen with me? Okay. Okay, great. And Candace is here. Hello. Hi, Candace. How are you? How are you, Danny? I'm doing fine. A little tired today for Monday, but I'm doing okay. <laughs> so let's see so uh there are one two three okay so we have chris grove tim bresnahan candace craig and danu here for, so uh, we have a quorum so i can go ahead and start our meeting um uh, so it's 602 and I will call the meeting for April 3rd to order, 2023. I'd like to introduce Anthony Lane. He's an applicant who's interested to join our para board. Um, Anthony, how are you tonight? You're on, there. Hi. You um, Hi, thank you, Danu, and thank you everyone. Uh, happy to be with you. Um, Danu, oh yeah, we just met just a little while ago down at the Armadillo, right, at, at uh, Robert Howdeck's, uh um gathering or the gathering oh, the birthday party so, um but anyway um it's nice to be with you all um you know, i just moved to manitou uh, with my family this past summer um we lived in colorado springs before that um 12 years ago and we just we lived out east in baltimore for a while and uh when we were coming back here we are you know I'm, i now work for the colorado state university system as a writer um and was trying to figure out where we could live and we desperately wanted to live in Manitou Springs and uh, so we we're really pleased that it worked out to be here and uh, you know we live up on Fairview and uh, you know just in the time we're gone I think the work that 
you know, this group in the city has done kind of with the parks and recreational opportunities is uh, really impressive. And so I just, I'm just looking for a way to be involved in that work. And, uh, you know, I've had a chance to look at the, the strategic plan and some of the other stuff you're doing. And uh, yeah, just um, excited to, you know, to see how I can, if I can contribute to this. So, um, but anyway, well, thanks for, you know, letting me join today and say a few words and yeah, hope I can be a part of it. Okay, great. Does anybody have any questions for Anthony? What kind of writing do you do, Anthony? <laughs> um, so I, my background, yeah, I was a journalist here in the Springs um, and then I've done kind of university like science writing, um, kind of um, and some public policy writing. Um, so now I'm kind of doing stuff for this system based on kind of initiatives that the system is working on. And, uh, you know, we have this cool new facility in Denver called CSU Spur, um, which I'm doing a lot of work uh, related to that. And just, you know, supporting various initiatives and working on op-eds and stuff like that. Cool. All righty. <clears throat> Great, well, thanks, Anthony. So uh, sit back and enjoy yourself. <laughs> I'm gonna move on with the, the agenda. Uh, could I get a motion to approve the agenda? I second. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda and, and then Candace seconds. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, all right, is anybody opposed? Okay, the agenda is approved. We have no minutes to approve tonight, so uh, we'll move to item four, public comments not on the agenda. Does anybody in the audience have any public comments? If not, I'll move on to item five, reports. Um, under PARA, um, I sat in uh, via Zoom at the uh, city council meeting where our arborist Matthew Nelson gave quite an extensive report on the trees at the library. We're gonna uh, have a new library addition on the old Carnegie building. And when they put the new addition in, it, it's gonna require a lot more engineering, uh, structural reinforcement of the, of the back wall to hold the, the, the hill up. And in doing that, we're gonna lose three of the old silver maple trees in the back. And um, it, it, they're pretty old and, and we knew in the, in back a few years ago that they were gonna probably have to go. But we're also gonna have to lose two of the big ponderosa pines, which is really sad. But I guess because of the, the way the addition is gonna footprint, it really encroaches on the, the root system of the trees. And um, Matthew didn't think there was a way that we could save them and they were too large to transplant. So he's gonna go ahead and, and replace those with, with new new smaller trees to infill, to replace those trees. And um, then the Arbor Day planting is scheduled for April 29th. Uh, we're gonna meet at nine o'clock at Shriver Park. And if you guys are interested, just shoot me an email so that uh, I can kind of tell Matthew how many volunteers we're gonna have so that he can plan accordingly to purchase uh, the um, amount of saplings that we can plant. And Anthony, you guys, your family's welcome to join us too, okay? So, um, so let me know. Uh, I would say bring your gloves, some shovels, you know, anything kind of uh, digging tools that you would need to plant trees. And with that, we move on to our council liaison, liaison Michelle. Hi. Hi. How have you been? I'm doing pretty good. Hang in there. Thank you. Are, you. are you healing up okay? Healing. Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. good. Very good. So well, I do not have anything to report. Yeah. Cause, uh, I, know, I know you missed that last meeting too. So, um, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, Michelle. And then um, open space. Uh, we have their, uh, their uh, agenda in the packet. And so let's move on to item six. John, our Park and Rec Director. This is John Stark. Hi, everybody. Um, John Stark for the Director's Report. I've got a few updates. 
Um, we're working to uh, to bring on an engineering firm to help with the pool roof project for that replacement project. Um, the engineering firm would be providing engineering drawings um, to help support um, plans basically that we would hand over to a roofing company to help bid on the project. Um, so we think that this is gonna provide a more complete picture of the work to be completed for the roofing companies to bid on the project. So right now we're trying to work to get the uh, firm that we selected under contract. Um, the, does anybody have any questions about that project? Uh, yeah, oh, did you select a firm already to do the, the roofing work? Yeah, we're still working to get them, or, or I'm sorry, just the engineering uh, firm we've selected. So once we get that, we'll be able to put that back out to the roofing companies that we've already um, solicited bids from. Um, and it'll help them to provide a more complete and accurate bid. So we're going to wait to select until we provide that to them. Okay. Okay. And then, and then can you talk about the, the bathrooms too? Because will you, will you do the ADA improvements the same time you do the roof since you'll have to close the pool? So that's the, that's the next item I have here is for the yeah. uh, pool ADA restrooms. We have that on hold currently. Our plan was originally to try to get that work as well as the, the roof projects underway here ahead of the summer season. Um, the feedback that we received um, from a bid on the pool ADA restroom basically was that they need the length of project time it needs to be expanded. Um, the bid came back quite a bit higher than what we um, had budgeted for. So what I'm proposing to do now is to take our um, to take our project basically back to our design firm to look at options to be able to scale it down um, and be able to work within our budget. So you know if we're able to do this project, we would be looking at moving the project, the ADA restroom project, back towards the end of summer. We don't want to do this and close down the facility. Um, during the busy summer months. So um, this is really kind of right now currently on hold until we're able to regroup, put this back out, probably do some scaled version of the project. Um, we would look to do it at the end of summer going into the fall. Okay. Offhand, do you know how much we have budgeted for that portion to do the ADA to, improvements? I'd have to go back to see what we have um, yeah, exactly. Um, offhand, I would say that it's somewhere around two hundred thousand dollars. Because I was going to say, you might be able to take some money out of the capital improvement fund, and that might be something worthwhile to look into. Yeah, I think you know for this that we need to take a look back at what the budget is as a whole um, for the different pool projects and see what we'll be able to accomplish. But um, for right now. There's more to you know learn and discover about what's possible um, later in the year. Um, if there's no more questions about the pool projects, I'll move down to the fields fence. So I would just wanted to check in with you all if you had any further direction where you'd like to go for the wrought iron fence installation, or if we'd rather go towards the removal of the existing chain link fence. We've already removed two sections of the fence to support the public art installation, but we plan to remove the remainder of it. Um, you know, and basically we would need to know whether or not we want to install that wrought iron fence or if we want to go with uh, having no fence at all. This is Chris. Um, I thought we were waiting until the, the art piece was installed to see how it looks or something before we were making a decision on that. That's just what I remember from doing the minutes from last month. Okay. Um, you know, I've been in contact with Becca, so um, I'd have to take a look back at the schedule, but I, my memory is that the installation was going to happen here in April, so um, I can check back in on that. Yeah, actually, actually, I remember that also that we were going to wait until that art piece was installed, and then we were going to re re revisit the fence again. I think. Okay. 
Um, just taking some notes here. Any, yeah. Anybody else? Does anybody yeah. else? This is Rebecca. Yeah, I think we were gonna wait, but if you, in the meantime, need to remove all the, like, the chain link, I think that's fine, um, because I think we're in agreement that that should probably go. But okay. okay. Well, if there's nothing more for the fields fence, I've got an update for our park positions. Um, you know, we've been currently really working to staff back up we have a number of different vacancies. So um, these past couple of weeks, we've been doing interviews and it looks like we have a candidate who's gonna accept our park manager position. Um, we've also got another candidate that we're working on for onboarding for the Arborist Assistant to work with Matthew, um, along with um, some, we're working on offers for a park maintenance worker, as well as a lead park maintenance uh, worker. So. There's a lot going on right now in terms of onboarding. And I'm really um, eager to get these folks on here, you know, ahead of our uh, busiest season. Um, so uh, we've got some great candidates and um, I'll have more to update hopefully uh, next month um, as we bring these folks on. Um, but um, this is really good news for our department. We really, um, you know, are, are in need of, of staffing up. So, um, hopeful uh, over these next couple of weeks, we're gonna be bringing people on board. Um, so that's it for my director report. Um, I can jump down into the parks, trails and open space maintenance report. Um, I wanted to, a little bit outside of the maintenance uh, aspect, but I wanted to announce that our summer baseball registration is open. Uh, so we're putting that out. Uh, if you know any families uh, that are interested in joining this program. Megan Weiss has done a really great job uh, helping to grow and expand this. So uh, lots of great opportunities. Um, check it out. Um, uh, share it with anybody that you can. Um, regular park maintenance, as always, um, you know, right now we're uh, down to just a couple of folks, but we're all working together, uh, picking up trash, replacing mud bit bags, our usual work, um, performing snow removal during our winter weather events, uh, we've been doing some trash patrols along Manitou Avenue um, on the uh, north side of town, the, near the chamber, near the Chase Bank. Manitou Avenue, we've been doing um, quite a bit of collaboration with Public Works to work on sidewalk and curb line cleanups. So getting out there early, um, cleaning up the uh, curbs and sidewalks um, and working with our sweepers. Um, our folks did some uh, locates for the irrigation system at the Carnegie Library uh, for the work to be done there. Um, as Danu mentioned, uh, Matthew presented at the uh, city council meeting about the uh, tree plan for the library. Our folks are uh, repainted the soccer field lines. Um, we've been doing cone patrols, uh, which uh, has been really trying to uh, go around town and find all of the different loose cones from different contractors and projects that have been left behind really in an effort just to clean things up. Um, so we found a, a good number of cones um, and then just generally cleaning up trailhead. So sharing some of the work um, that's being done by our park maintenance staff. Does anybody have any questions? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, who did who who um who takes care of like the Intamin Trail? Um, I they did a great job um, on Bevers. I, I think it's different people probably. Have you did you see that Bevers Trail? Mm -hmm. How nice that looks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so um, you know, there's certainly a section of the Intamin Trail that's part of Manitou Springs, but the City of Colorado Springs has been doing uh, work trail work generally all around Red Rock Canyon. So that was likely the work that you were seeing was a part of their project. Who works on the Intamin Trail out here, like between the cemetery and the junior high school? So the Intamin Trail out here is the responsibility of our department, the Parks Department. This is year, we're going to be working with um, the Rocky Mountain Field Institute and the Mile High Youth Corps during the fall to prioritize different trail projects. So we haven't selected um, our trail maintenance projects uh, yet for this year to collaborate with them, but um, it's possible that the Inman Trail might be included. In need help? Yeah, we always need help. I have some um, ideas. 
one of the one of the uh, yeah always happy to uh, hear <laughs> ideas um we'll put together you know some of our trail maintenance priorities and then we always um you know we'll work with rimfi to prioritize what we want to accomplish and, and then of course we'll do work in house too as we bring on our summer season folks yeah um you know candace you might want to sit in on the OSAC meeting share some of your ideas with them okay i i think um all these acronyms uh, uh open space and and trails is uh OSAC advisory committee OSAC and Candace, you can always okay. you can always reach out to me and give me a call or shoot me an email with any ideas you have or if you ever want to go visit out in the field. Um, always happy to go take a hike. All right, I will write that down, John Stark. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and actually, Shannon, who was here about the bees, he's the chair of the OSAC committee. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, Oh, John, you know, the <clears throat> of all these these uh, employees that you're interviewing, you know, the last park manager we had was like a working park manager, mm -hmm. and he was really familiar with working trails and trail mm -hmm. maintenance. Will any of these guys, do they have any kind of trail experience like that, too? Yeah, the, um, you know, it can't go, I guess, into details until we uh, have the candidate on board. Um, right. But, you know, the candidate that we're looking at that we've extended an offer has extensive experience kind of across the board in all sorts of different park maintenance. And the way that I've put this out to candidates is that this is very much a, a field based manager position. So the way I see this position working is that they're 90 percent of the time in the field Good. Uh, directing our crews. So and doing um, actual works too, moving that shovel too. what's that moving that shovel too? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all do. <laughs> But, uh, you know, for the folks that we're bringing in, one of the things I'm excited to is that I've already, um, you know, uh, designated a few spots with Rocky Mountain Field Institute for their upcoming Pikes Peak crew leader training. So even folks that may not have as much, you know, trail maintenance experience, they're going to go through this training uh, that's over uh, a two day period and really understand some of the fundamentals of basic trail maintenance. So. Um, there's always opportunities to grow your skills. Okay, well, that's it for my update. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, John. Item seven, new business, uh, pickleball courts. Um, before we got our new uh, two separate pickleball courts, we had our two existing tennis courts striped for pickleball. So they they were both a tennis court and a pickleball court. So uh, there was a, a, an email sent out by Jan making note of how many people were out there playing pickleball. And she started planning to see that maybe it'd be great if we had another pickleball court somewhere. So I was going to ask Para what you all thought about putting striping on the tennis court for an optional pickleball court. And, uh, and uh, Colin, who can't be here tonight, his input was that he was in favor of that. However, he wanted the people who were wanting to play tennis to have first, first dibs uh, so that the, the pickleball players would yield to the tennis court players. Any thoughts on that? That sounds hey, Daniel, this is Tim. I love that idea. Tim? Yeah, I, I like that. And I support Colin's suggestion, making that a tennis priority if the players are there looking to play tennis. Okay. And Candace? Yes, I agree with everybody. How would you enforce that, though? Right? If well, a pickleball okay. person. Hey, Shane, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was there yesterday playing pickleball and there were a million people playing pickleball and it was super fun and I talked to them about it and they are all in favor of striping it and I think that the way that you enforce it there's already like a sort of a cultural way that people do things there you hang your racket on the outside of the thing Anyway, um, I think it would work out, and I think the pickleballers are nice enough that they would yield to the 
tennis players, and if we just posted a, a sign or something that indicated that that was the case, people would be cool with that. Mm -hmm. Rebecca? No, I mean, I just don't think you can enforce it, but if they're like, I don't think people are gonna go to arms, you know, they can just wait, it's fine. Yeah, just maybe a little signage. I think people are pretty polite and respectful. Yeah, we're not talking about a bunch of teenagers. Typically we're talking, you know, we're talking about older, mature adults. I think I think they'll, they'll be good, cool with the honor system. <laughs> I don't know. There is there is trouble <laughs> brewing across the country between tennis players and pickleball players. I think we're special and we can handle it. But uh, uh, grown up pickleball players and tennis players have been in conflict in many places. So I think if we set the expectation up front, uh, hopefully it'll help to, to set the stage and people will continue to be civil. There already is signage that says something like one hour limit or something. Um, I can't remember the exact verbiage, but I think if we just added on to that, that um, pickleballers yield to tennis players if there are, if somebody arrives. Okay. And I also met this guy, Buddy. Have you guys met Buddy? He's like a pickleball teacher. And I asked him if he was interested in teaching rec classes because he's really good and really nice. And um, anyway, I'll try to recruit him. I'll, I'll set him up with Megan to uh, maybe he could, maybe we could expand our rec program. That would be great. Okay. Um, so then. Uh, is there everybody in favor of uh, adding striping to the tennis court to, to for uh, the dimensions of a pickleball court? Yes. Okay. Is there? Oh, let me ask. Is there, is there anybody opposed to that idea? Okay. Well, then I, I would say that um, we all vote in favor of of, of adding a, additional striping to the tennis court to uh, accommodate the pickleball people. And then I guess, John, I guess what you just need to do is find out the dimensions of, of where those lines need to go and maybe in different color uh, other than the, the tennis color and maybe stripe in for pickleball. John Stark. Yeah, I think, you know, I would like to see what the, the cost associated with that would be too to get it painted. Um, and, you know, would there be support from pair up to you know, to pay for the cost of the painting of the lines on the court. We can take that out of our uh, El Paso Becker's uh, maintenance fund. Okay. Same place, same place where the fence will come from. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then I think uh, last time you guys were able to do that in house. It would be something that I would have to investigate. Yeah. Yeah. You might ask uh, Roy, cause I, I know that uh, the other parks guys used to do it so well, i'll take a look into it okay great thank you all right anybody else okay then i'd, I'd like to move hey, on yeah go ahead tim oh just real quick and i i don't i, I apologize if uh we're getting off topic or taking this further than it needs to be but we had talked previously also about looking for additional sites for more courts and did we ever get any follow-up on whether or not that there's a possibility to use other spaces? Um, no, well, I didn't follow up. I, you know, I, I originally, I went for a hike and uh, there's that really <laughs> nice dirt lot in back of the middle school. And I, I was toying with the idea of maybe asking this the d14 school district if they would be interested to maybe uh building a pickleball court back there i i don't know if you folks know you, you probably don't know where i'm talking about but in the back of the manitou middle school um there's a a dirt lot back there that they have uh i think they have a net set up for volleyball and 
they, we used to have big bonfires back in the day. The, the they are the really they are really strict now back yes. then about about adults coming through there. They don't want anybody coming <laughs> through there. Right. So that's know. so that that would be like a discussion that we would have to have with D14. But I mean, it was it was a remote <laughs> idea that I had or a possibility to create another uh, pickleball court. But that's when I decided to shift and just stay with trying to restripe the add additional striping to the tennis court or another pickleball court. So I don't know. Uh, that's the only other place where I could think of. I had a crazy thought. What what about the shuffleboard courts at Mansions Park that are never used? I, th I thought about them too. And uh, I mean, it, it seems like we had could potentially have some multi-use space over there. Uh, maybe not a topic for this meeting, but um, something to think about for the future. Uh, who knows, we could do midnight pickleball in the Soda Springs Pavilion. Just, I'm just spitballing. Ping pong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so many possibilities. Right, right. But let's, yeah. uh, let's keep, uh, if we can, let's keep the thought of uh, additional sites on our, um, radar? on our agenda. Yeah, on our radar, thanks. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Uh, organic turf care. Um, for a brief history, um, back in uh, back in the day, we used to uh, use regular typical weed pesticide to uh, kill all the dandelions and all the weeds. And one day, this this uh, uh, these parents were hanging out with their children at the play park. When the guy came and, and just fumigated, just blew all his his toxic uh, mm -hmm. chemicals all over the park lawn, and so they complained to the city about you know how how uh, unhealthy that was for everybody, the environment and their children and the adults, etc. So um, Para decided to look into uh, uh, contacting a uh, organic uh, company who applied organic pesticide, we, we, I don't know what you call it, herbicide uh, to the lawns and, and to, to switch all of our, our care to an organic earth-friendly product. And so um, what we agreed with the city was that they would pay the, the, the fee of what they had been paying uh, the company that was was spreading all the herbicide, harmful, harmful herbicide, and the cost difference of us having an organic uh, company come in to do the treatment, we paid up that difference, which at that time, back in 2012, was like $10,000. So we were able to hire on a company to uh, start applying all or, or organic earth-friendly product to our lawns, and we got away from uh, using the herbicides on the park turf. So a few years went by and a city uh, worker was uh, using Roundup on the sidewalk weeds. And uh, they were doing it uh, around the mansions park where there are edible gardens in the fenced areas there. And so the people who were trying to raise their vegetables were all upset and up in arms because all of these harmful toxic Roundup pesticides were being sprayed by their vegetables. So they approached Parab and um, through, through other groups too who were not happy with the round, use of Roundup, Parab was tasked with creating an organic land management policy. And so uh, Jenna Gallus, who isn't with us anymore, started it and then Tim Bresnahan jumped on board and, and uh, continued it. So Tim, you wanna go ahead and talk about that a little bit? And then also if you can talk about the history of, of, of how it's evolved with, with city staff, et cetera. Yeah, sure, Danu. I think that this is 
Um, more than anything, I think that this is one of the examples of us responding to um, interest from the community and really kind of moving with where our citizens are and what they've asked us to do. So it, as you could hear from what Danu described, there were a lot of different things that kind of happened at the same time that got our citizens interested in this. Uh, city staff then, uh, in response, asked Parab um, and council asked Parab to consider this issue and think about feasibility and examples. And Jenna and I wrote the draft of what became our organic uh, land management policy. We started writing that in 2016 and it was ultimately um, approved in 2018 and really got a lot of positive feedback um, from that. And we've gone through a couple different ways to in, kind of enact that policy in care of our parks and specifically our turf. And we had used uh, clean air lawn care um, in order to accomplish that for our turf at first. And then eventually city staff were able to uh, take that over in the last few years. Um, and I think that the attention that we paid to the turf in general and specifically through the organic land management policy has really made a great difference in uh, the quality and the durability of the turf. As everybody knows, we get a ton of wear and tear, particularly in Memorial Park from events and keeping up with that is, is a real challenge. Uh, and particularly be able to keep up with the needs of that turf and not use products that uh, might keep citizens or animals off of the turf, not to mention introducing excess nitrogen and things like that that people are worried about into our creek uh, have all been positive. So we are always mindful of you know what's what's being used to care for our parks and particularly the quality of our turf. And so um, I think Danu and I wanted to make sure everybody, since we have a lot of turn, have had a lot of turnover and a lot of new members, know kind of the history of that and kind of where we are. Um, if anybody has any specific questions about sort of what that is or how it looks, I'd be happy to try to answer that. But then going forward, we of course want to make sure that we are always being proactive on our turf, which is a huge, um, huge part of the organic land management policy because because we are not using. Um, chemical fertilizers uh, or pesticides, uh, playing catch up is always more difficult. And uh, with the staffing problems that we've had lately, we wanna make sure that um, we're being proactive and getting ready for our summer uh, season and that that turf is ready to go. So we wanted to open up the conversation with uh, the city to make sure that we are you know, doing everything that we can from a pair of standpoint and our resources and that the city is doing everything they can to make sure that our, our turf is healthy and that we are working within our management policies. Dan, does that sum things up, I think? Yeah, that is because uh, um, I recently hooked up uh, John Stark with uh, Clean Air Lawn and he had a meeting with them. And, and John, if you want to go ahead and talk about that a little bit. Sure. So we met with Clean Air Lawn and we asked for different quotes uh, for estimates, basically based on different parks for their services. So I've received those estimates back and, um, you know, I really appreciated the, um, you know, the time that uh, Steve Mole spent uh, putting those together for us. So, um, you know, looking at these estimates, it's not, uh, it's, 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 it's fairly expensive to take care uh, park to park. So Memorial Park, for example, Steve's estimate was nearly $7,000 uh, for the, the care for the year. And that includes the top dressing and overseeding, um, as well as the, the spot spraying with weed control um, for using, um, you know, tenacity or fiesta, some of those things. So, um, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, we really don't have this within our parks budget to be able to support clean air, um, to be able to do this at our different parks at that cost. Um, so right now the plan is, you know, as we staff back up is to continue to do this in house. 
within the parks budget. Okay, so can I can I ask a few questions, John? Sure. So he he did line items for for each thing. So without the top dressing and the overseeding, and without him doing aeration, if he just applied organic product like the organic herbicides and the organic fertilizer, did he break that down line by line? He has it broken down. Um, it How would much? be. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you look at that, it'd be around fifteen hundred dollars for Memorial Park, for example. Would that be a one-time shot, or would that be for the year? That would be for the year. Okay. That's without the top dressing or overseeding. Right. Which your which staff could do, right? Staff could do that part. Yeah. I mean, uh, right now, currently, like I said, I mean, we don't really have the this planned in our budget right um so well, if this was something that you know parab would be interested in supporting um you know that would be the direction that you know i guess i would be interested in seeing what level of support parab could have mm -hmm. so so if you went through all if we if we pulled out the big parks the ones that get the most use parab what would you say beside memorial would be another like Name some other big parks that you think would benefit from definitely having the uh, organic treatment beside Memorial. Because right now, as it stands, you're saying it's 1500 just for the just for Steve to apply the organic uh, material, right? Yeah, so I, I mean, that's an estimate based on what I'm seeing as he's broken it down by line items. Uh huh. Because what what I'm thinking is is that I think Para would would uh, I I would be uh, willing to ask Para to go ahead and pay to have Steve apply these organic products to the turf uh, of of the lawns so long as you know it stays within reason of our budget, and then to have your city staff do all the rest of the stuff. Okay. And, you know, are we looking to new just at Memorial Park or are you proposing this for other parks? Well, well, how about, why don't you, did he do Fields also? Did he do Fields Park? Let me pull up Fields. Okay. Hey, Danu, I'd also wonder how long do we think it will take until city staff is up to speed and able to take over? I think I think the interest here primarily is to ensure that we don't lose any time, valuable time uh, before the season gets underway. Right. Do we know, like, uh, I know it's difficult to predict, but do we have any good estimates of when city staff might be able to fully take over? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that we have plans to do our regular turf management here within the parks department for the year. so. Um, you know, depending on the, you know, the, the season and the type of year it is with, you know, with rain, um, you know, we're going to see, you know, hopefully, um, you know, a successful year ahead with turf care. Um, you know, as I'd mentioned earlier, we're right now in the process of staffing up. Um, so, you know, once, once we hit this summer season, you know, I'm confident that we'll have the staff available to continue to do um, this work in house. Um, you know, if we're looking at doing treatment for a couple of different parks, I think that Memorial Park and Fields Park could be a place that we, you know, give this a shot to see what it looks like. And then we can compare those two parks to um, you know, some of the other parks that we're caring for and try to see what, you know, what the value might be, the added value of uh, bringing somebody in. Um, but, you know, at the same time, depending on how we scale this, of course, the city has its own uh, procurement process too, right? So um, might have to get some quotes from some other companies as well. Um, so, you know, if we're looking at this for right now, we're just looking at uh, application for Memorial Park. Um, that could be something that we could do underneath our five thousand dollar threshold. Right. <clears throat> so what what does fields come in at? Let me get fields up here. 
1,500, 1,600, 2,500 or so. Um, and that's again without the, the top dressing or overseeding. Mm -hmm. So let's see, we're about uh, two, three. So we're about up to 4,000 now. Yeah, and that's, yep, that's probably about what you'd be able to do. Yeah. Did, did he put Bill Bowers in there too? Let me pull it up. <laughs> so I know Bill a lot, a lot of uh, kids play on Bill Bowers too. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to think of where, you know, parks to get the most use. It's, uh, you know, it's an estimate again. I'm just doing some quick math, but yeah, you're around a thousand dollars or so. So um, you'd be really kind of right up against it. Yeah. Do you guys know where Bill Bowers Park is? Para? No. Bill Bowers Park is up in Crystal Hills, right at Sutherland. Oh. Sutherland and Crystal Park Road. It's I where know we where paint it. our soccer field. I'm sorry? It's where we paint the soccer field. Oh, right, right, right. So all the more reason to put organic product on that lawn then. Yeah. Well, if, if we keep it at 5,000, we don't have to put it out for bid, right? Yeah, it would need to come under 5,000. Um, so we need to do some math to see where it's all at. But yeah, you'd probably be able to do those three. And then that, if, uh, what about Soda Springs? Or is that still under the warranty or whatever? I don't have a quote for Soda Springs. Okay. Yeah, and I, actually that's... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I probably isn't still under warranty though, Chris. Um, but um, you know, and and John, even even if uh, I guess even if we go over five thousand, then it would just require you to call mm -hmm. a couple other companies to get bids from them, right? Yeah, I would. So yeah. I would need to get you know I need to get three bids. So that would be something that I would be able to work on too, of course. Yeah. So um, I know that a lot of this has to happen like soon in the spring. Like usually we do top dressing and overseeding in the spring and aeration in the spring. And, uh, and, and uh, Steve would have to coordinate with uh, the parks department too for some of his treatment. Right. But, but let me ask Para, would Para be willing to you know, set aside $10,000 in our budget to go ahead and pay for the organic treatment of, of, uh, of some of these larger parks, the turf? I guess all I would ask is, you know, if we're spending that kind of money, wouldn't it make sense for us to uh, consider doing that in-house and getting training, et cetera? Because it seems pretty significant at that point. The, you know, that would, that would be the end-all goal. But the problem, David, is that it's a very specialized knowledge working with organic product. So that means that you have to know what products to use. You have to know where to get you know, the product and when to apply the product and how much of the product to apply. So that would be something that uh, an ambitious city employee would have to really have to take on to do some research in lieu of, of being taught on the on the job, you know, or watching uh, the cleaner lawn care company, you know, doing it, I guess. That, that's why minimally, minimally, could we get some savings out of just, I mean, if we're going to do the, the, that many locations, wouldn't we get <clears throat> more of a discount? Mm, no. No. See, because he's got to he's got to pay so much for his product too, and so the product plus the labor pretty much is is uh, is is pretty is set pretty good. Now I, I will you know I I'm looking back here I'm not sure I I think that I, I set aside at least I'm thinking thirty or forty thousand dollars in our parks budget, so the ten thousand dollars would be coming out of the parks budget so. We, we would have plenty of, 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 of revenue there to be able to pull that from. 
And that conservation trust fund where that money would get pulled out of is uh, we get steady, steady revenue, yearly revenue from the lottery. So the 10,000 that we would put out this year, we would get it back next year with our $50,000 uh, that we get every year. Donu, so is there a way though, so that we don't have to keep forking because the cost is only going to keep going up. I mean, I'm definitely in favor of supporting the organic component, but um, I think that's what David's getting at too, of like, is this a sustainable thing that we can keep supporting or can the city start to build it into their own budget? I don't know. Well, that's a conversation we should have. Um, myself, I, I'm, you know, <laughs> well, Tim and I have put so much energy into this and gone around and around and around with different city staff and, and turnover and, and just trying to stay on top of it because there was a time when Memorial Park looked like one big dirt lot. It was, in fact, they had a big uh, antique car show where they parked all the cars right on the dirt because there was no grass there. So at that time, back in 2010, uh, Parab shelled out like $10,000 to tear it all up and have it all reseeded, top soil and everything. And then we, we fenced it off so nobody could, could uh, use that park for a whole year until all that, that uh, turf came in, all that seed grew. And uh, we kept, we got those, the sprinkler system going and we brought it back. So by the time Steve uh, came with Clean Air Lawn in 2012, we actually uh, had somewhat of a lawn that he was tasked with, you know, taking care of. And he, with his stuff of, of his, his lawn care, really brought it back. So it really looks, it looked beautiful, really. And he has pictures that uh, he took. And so I have a, a, a my own, I have a personal uh, commitment to keeping our, our turf looking good because I've seen it at, at the point of, of a dirt lot and then coming back to having a really nice turf, so. I, I think it's also important though for everybody to know that it's not that there's kind of two separate issues. One is that we've got the, the OLM policy as a city policy. It was adopted by the city. Whatever, the, whatever our city does in the parks will be in, um, uh, uh, will be consistent with that policy. And that's not something that we need to worry about um, necessarily because they've got that blueprint. I think the bigger concern is that with staff shortages and staff turnover that we are gonna be behind the eight ball and again, because we have the organic land management policy, we can't just show up and spray a ton of nitrogen and chemical herbicide late if we miss out on the being proactive, which is really one of the key parts of making this system work. And so uh, we wanna make sure that if there is a stopgap, something like that that needs to be filled in the short term while city staff is getting up to speed, that's what we want to explore. It's not taking necessarily taking over this whole thing uh, or taking it back over the way we've done in the past, because yes, it's expensive and that would drain resources that we're trying to use to do other important things like, uh, you know, finish prior projects, start new park projects, things like that. Um, so I just want to make sure that everybody's clear that this is not, the city is going to do something different. It's more we want to make sure that the city has the resources in the short term while staffing is getting up. So any other information we can get in terms of when city staff is going to be able to do this stuff or if they can do it now and kind of what we can do, I would certainly be in favor of trying to, you know, limit our scope so that we, you know, minimize the effect on our budget if we can. But um, that's just my opinion. That said, I do think it's important that we just make sure that things are moving and that we're being proactive. Yeah, I, 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 I think we all hear you both of, you know, like your message in terms of what both Danu and Tim are both saying. I guess the question is, is back to Rebecca's point, this is a pretty significant amount of money. So it seems to me like this should be factored into an, you know, an annual operating cost or, or managed some other way so that we're not taking this kind of hit because there's a lot that we could do with 10 grand. 
that's I, I think that's sort of the bottom line. Yeah, and I support getting it going for this year, absolutely. Because again, I know there's that special window of time, um, but I just don't wanna get to this position because it seems like there's staff shortages every year and we keep going through this process. So just trying to think long-term, but definitely I'd support that for this year, for sure. Janu, do you need a motion? Yeah, probably that would be good. Uh, anytime it's- Okay, it's, I'll, yeah. I'll go ahead and make a motion that we move forward this year with the uh, procuring the services for the organic treatments of the park. I second that motion. This is Chris Grove. And what do we want our scope to be? Do we want to focus on the highest traffic areas? Do we want to include all areas with turf? I don't know what everybody thinks about that. Well, I, I guess we have to decide how much money we want to spend. So, so David, with your motion, can you can you add in a dollar amount there uh, of, of what we're willing to, to commit uh, of our budget for this year for this uh, organic treatment to get started? Okay, so John, am I hearing $10,000? Well, I just pulled that up, but because that's what in the past, that's what we've, we've paid out of our budget for this. Okay, so I would amend my motion to include a number not to exceed $10,000 without further pair of approval. Okay, now, do you think you can sum it all up, David? <laughs> One more time? For your motion? Okay. Yeah. So I'm putting forward a motion to approve an amount not to exceed $10,000 for the organic treatment of parks as directed by John Stark. Okay, does, does, does anybody uh, want to second that? Yeah. Second. Okay, Candace seconds, discussion? Okay, all in favor, just raise your hand or say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, motion passes, all approved. So then John, Stark? Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, I guess if, you're comfortable to go back to Steve. Are you okay with this, John? Yeah, I am. Um, you know, again, I, I need to put out there that the city has, you know, its own procurement policy, right? So sure. we'll sure. have to put this out to bid. It doesn't mean that Steve would be selected, right? Um, so um, yeah, I mean, this is great that we'll have this additional support to help our parks. Yeah, so could you possibly um, send me a copy of all his cut sheets, his spreadsheets, just so I can kind of like, I can, maybe I can meet with you, Ashley. Can we get together and I can meet with you? And Yeah, I think that would that? be best. We can kind of yeah. work out what uh, scope might be for and, how we would spend this funding. And to see if Steve's willing to do it like that also. I mean, yeah, if it's right. just, yeah, so... So yeah, if, if he's not willing to do that, I mean, uh, I guess I would propose looking at doing maybe like Memorial Park um, and, you know, we would see how that how that works out for a year. Right. Um, so, you know, that might be an option, too, but it sounds like there's more for us to investigate. OK. OK. Very good. Okay, so if there isn't anything else, I'm gonna to move to item two, the Higginbotham Flats Master Plan. Uh, first of all, Higginbotham Flats is that big area that's across from Cave of the Winds where the, the storage units are. 
Um, it's where the traffic light is. Are you are you folks familiar familiar with that uh, area? The city the city has has been using it to uh, dump the mulch up there. And at one time we had a community garden, um, and there's some park benches all at the very end of it for overlook. And um, we are looking at trying to develop a vision for a master plan for that area. Um, so in full disclosure, I am part of the Save the Flats board. And so um, out, of, out of me not being in, a, a, in, in any conflict, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the meeting over to Tim. And I'm going to become a citizen of Save the Flats, attending your meeting. Tim, you want to take over? Sure. But I think before we switch, just um, yeah, where are we in terms of our goals for discussion tonight? Um, what I what I did is is I I sent out uh, the meeting minutes of a joint meeting that Save the Flats and Parab had, I think back in 2020. And in that that email uh, minutes, it outlined some some of the goals and mutual agreements that Parab and Save the Flats had. So um, I don't know, did, it, did anybody get a chance to go through that and read that? I did. So I guess I guess review that I guess Tim and then yeah I guess yeah I think where we are right now is mostly kind of a let's get back on track uh, in terms of our goals discussion which we've already done some work before but things have been off and on and then of course with um, you know, board turnover and staff turnover. We feel that it's important to get this back on, um, back on the back on the agenda as a, a reoccurring item, so we can keep this current and keep attention on it. Does that sound about right? Yes. Yeah. Does this sound so, right, everybody? Okay. Go ahead, Tim. Okay. I guess I I would start by just uh, you know saying that we've had a goal for. A, a long time to try to get some interest and energy to activate that space and to um, as park space. And where we've where we've gotten to at this point is a focus really on on um, well, I should say there's a large space up there. If you, if you for anybody who's ever been up there, there's quite a bit of space. Uh, we've really been focusing on the overlook area. Uh, we've been looking for something that's uh, kind of an, an attainable goal. Um, and so we'd like to get things moving to um, conceptualize an overlook park, what that would look like in terms of maybe providing access to other amenities like trails uh, in that area, what that could look like in terms of a gateway to Manitou. Um, and then use that as a springboard to develop in that entire area. Now that's a, it's a large project and uh, it's gonna take some time and input from a lot of different stakeholders, which uh, as far as I know, Parab is really kind of it in terms of banging the drum to keep the interest on this area. So uh, with all that said, um, assuming that everybody's had a chance to take a look at the minutes from that last meeting, I think minus all the stuff about the COG car, because that's kind of uh, a side note at this point. Um, does anybody have any questions about sort of where we've been before or any, if nobody has any questions, I'd open it up to discussion where anybody thinks we should get started going forward from here. Hey, Tim. Um, this is Rebecca. Um, a couple of questions. So some of those spaces like adjoining, we had the um, Adventure Out West. 
Did we ever figure out what that was going to happen with that? Do we know? Or is it just sitting there? Or It's for sale. It's for sale. And would that be a potential addition for us? Or is it too out of pocket? Um, it's it's it would be a huge benefit for our, our park, but I think they're asking a million dollars for it. Yeah. Um, another thing that we've talked about since this one um, that you the minutes you shared was doing some sort of native consultation, right? And I think that would be an important component in whatever regard, um, however that makes it. And I think. Um, the mayor was a bit on board with that, right? With the adding the rocks. And so I think that's also another important component that we kind of pursue in whatever format, but. This is Chris. Um, I agree with Rebecca. And I think that we need to consult with all the stakeholders. Um, so including OSAC um, and I don't know who are there any other stakeholders that we need to identify. I don't know if the city is a stakeholder, um, but I think we need to consult with each stakeholder prior to, you know, moving. Or, you know that needs to be one of our first steps. I guess is my opinion. Anybody else have any thoughts or ideas on what they would like to see in that space? One thing, another idea, um, and we kind of thrown this around a little bit. I think you brought it up, Tim, but doing like a pump track up there. Um, I know, and maybe Chris, you can talk to this, but the medicine wheel is trying to connect a lot of the trails throughout the city. Um, and bringing that up to Higginbotham would be pretty cool too. Um, there's a lot of considerations though with like that particular area. We'd have to con uh, consult with uh, CDOT, I think, just because of the location of it and with as busy it is with the highway. Um, but that would be another potential option. And John, sorry, this is so off point, but could you stop sharing your screen so we don't just see a giant blue screen on our is that possible? Sorry. If not, no worries. There, yay, <laughs> thank you. Always looking for that FaceTime, huh, Rebecca? <laughs> Can't get enough of it with my job. Well, I should say going forward, I think this is an opportunity for us to revisit the work that's already been done. If you haven't, I would encourage everybody to take a look at the minutes from that last meeting that Don, you shared. I would also direct everybody to look at the um, the comments about Higginbotham Flats from the uh, getting older every day post plan, but I think that's still important. Uh, and some, and think about some of the things that we've heard from community input so far, which is connectivity is an important thing. If there's any possibility that this could help to link um, amenities from uh, other areas like open space and trails, um, keeping things as low maintenance as possible is also important. Uh, also thinking about this as a Kind of a gateway feature to Manitou uh, is also an important thing. We've had some other great ideas just spitballing within our group about things like uh, pump track, for example. And that was actually Chris Groh's idea. Um, I have to give her credit for that, but that would be, I think, an interesting and exciting uh, potential use of, of a lot of that space that's been degraded from prior uh, construction activities. Um, I, of course, always put forward the idea of a giant slide. Um, I know nobody takes me seriously, but I really am serious about that. But just an example of things that could be done. Um, I don't know if we have a lot else that we can get done substantively right now. Um, 
while we work on getting everybody up to speed and then just making sure that this continues to be an agenda item. Well, and just to like clue new folks into the, um, the Creek Walk Trail is supposed to be going all the way to the, um, what's it called? The waterfall, the Rainbow yeah. Falls area. Rainbow Falls. And then there's supposed to be a trail, like I think it's maybe a, a foot trail or something that goes over open space land up to Higginbotham from there. And there's also a connection. Um, if anyone ever walks up there, there's now, now they're building, a, I think they're going to be building a home up there soon. But there's a connection that goes, I think it's called Manitou Terrace is the official name of the street so there's a neighborhood up above the post office and there is an actual street that's platted that goes up to Higginbotham Flats it does cross or like it does potentially crosses that million dollar piece of property that's for sale but um anyway there there are you know viable connection points to town where people, you know, neighbors, uh, kids, all all sorts of people could get up there without having to drive a car up there. Um, so I think working with OSAC, working with whoever's working on Creek Walk, um, you know, the city, I think that's all things that we need to, you know, not like, work on this in a silo but we need to like collaborate with other folks to uh you know have the best product at the end i agree chris but i think also like it's good that we keep talking about it but we keep talking about it without a real plan in action and so i think that might be the next step is to determining like okay, what is our schedule, right? Project management 101, what's our schedule? Who do we need to start talking to? Who's gonna do the work and whatnot? Because if we really want something to happen, we have to actually start moving. Yeah, I would agree. And I think that we just need sort of, you know, a mission and a vision. If we could, if we could start there and all start agreeing at that place and what we want it to look like, because until we put some shape to it, it's just, I agree, it's just not gonna happen. All right, Tim, what are we doing? Yeah, I think we have a lot of that basic stuff there. I think the missing pieces are commitment from the city and how we need to be interacting with uh, open space. Um, to me, seem to be the two biggest um, things. I mean, we could we could spend fifty thousand dollars on you know an architect and engineering and design firm tomorrow and come up with some great options, but I don't know if that's going to get us anywhere if we don't have uh, involvement from other important parties with this. Now, John, can you can you comment on on interest from the city or I don't know if if um, uh, Michelle is still on if I don't know if this is something that is on our radar or if it's possible to to move on this now, where are we? I would say to meet with the city, to meet with city council, to let, to give us an idea of, you know, what you're looking at cost wise, because we already have a budget for 2023. So we'd be looking into 2024. There's definitely an opportunity to partner with what OSAC has going on with the Serpentine area. Uh, we applied for a grant earlier this year um, that we received match funds for $100,000 to basically do preliminary plans uh, for the area. Um, and that would be a great point to connect um, what would be uh, the Creek Walk Trail basically up to Rainbow Falls and then ultimately Higginbotham. So I think there's an opportunity to have a further conversation about what the next steps would be in the planning process for uh, Higginbotham uh, with 
that's doing a master plan or some other level of planning. Well, I would suggest, you know, with those unknowns out there, if we really want to move forward and get some planning done, I don't know, my gut would tell me that we should limit the scope to an overlook park so we don't get too far ahead of these other projects uh, that are happening and we can have that opportunity to uh, coordinate as we go forward. I mean, what do you guys think about, about shrinking the scope so that we can get some planning started? Would this be part of the bigger like revision of the master plan? Because we talked a little bit about that. And we and again, Michelle, we're talking, um, just brainstorming and getting ideas. And then, because we're not actually going to do anything till at least next year, I think was our plan. Right, Danu, is that right? Well, I, I think I, we, Parab has money in our budget for a master plan. So it is conceivable that if we can come up with a vision of what we want to see in our master plan that we can start putting together an RFP for uh, architectural architects to put together some, some plans based on whatever vision uh, and components that, that Parab would like to see. You know, I, I think the, the main things is, is having low maintenance, keeping it natural and perhaps maybe having um, a sense of purpose or a, a sense of some kind of a theme, maybe. But also, you know, trying to, you know, utilize rainwater uh, for pollinator gardens. Did, should, you know, did, <laughs> would you guys like me to read the common goals and vision from those minutes? The common goals and visions uh, that Parab and Save the Flats agreed on were low maintenance overlook park, edible trees and bushes, developing pollinator habitats with zero scape, no lighting, collect rainwater and or explore detention ponds, have a helioport staging area or emergency vehicle access, egress for flooding for the Agate Hill neighborhood so that they can get out of there. Trails creation and trailhead, maintaining ground permeability, limited parking and interpretive signage. So maybe if we if we just stay within within that kind of guideline and then maybe kind of shape it a little more. Or add the, the the component of of having that that uh, that sense of 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 uh, of, of uh, a theme, you know, where that's where we sort of moved into the native component, the indigenous people component. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Well, I I've said this before. I don't think that that's something. I mean, I don't think that that's a place that we need to go. I think that um, you know all of our natural recreation um, options absent are, you know, parks in the center of Manitou or on the, on the south uh, side of town. And, you know, that would pr just provide an incredible vista, you know, for Manitou. It would be our, you know, gateway coming in from uh, the north side and would be just a tremendous addition to other things that we already have and enjoy. I don't think we need to bend over backwards to search for meaning. Yeah. Um, I'm standing on my deck and looking at it right now, and I can I can see the beauty right there. Yeah. But um, what what does everybody think about maybe instead of trying to think about that entire space and what we do with all of that and thinking about things like parking and uh, alternative things? Again, I'd really like to bring us back to focusing on maybe something that we can accomplish and focusing on that overlook park. Yeah. So, yeah, are you saying, Tim, that adding the uh, indigenous people component definitely complicates it? Is that what I hear? 
because it, it would, because it would be a lot more uh, stakeholder uh, re re research, et cetera. I, yeah, I don't, I just, again, I don't think that, I, I don't know. I Maybe there's something that I'm missing, but um, for us, I don't understand why we would be initiating that. Okay. Well, I think for me, when we say sense of place, right, you know, and that was a big component for some of our city parks, right, sense of place, but yeah. sense of place for who and who are we remembering and that kind of component. Um, I don't know. That's my thoughts. Um, if we have a, a way to do proper outreach, um, yes, it takes work, but it doesn't take any dollars. So maybe the sense of place can be achieved through the signage, because I think that's what you had originally uh, offered up. Yeah, and it doesn't have to signage. be like, yeah, and I'm, when I'm talking about native consultation, I'm not, we don't have to design the whole park around it, but it's just input of that particular space, I think would be a nice component. Yeah, I can see that happening through the, the, the interpretive signage. Yeah. Right, and the plants that we select and a lot of those different things, it'd be pretty straightforward, but. And I think that Mayor Graham has made a commitment to include um, indigenous communities moving forward. Um, I mean, at least that he gave lip service to that during the Indigenous Peoples Day. And so I just think, you know, when are we going to start? Like, if we don't start now, then we're never going to do it. I think this is also getting us off topic though. I mean, if we, we, we still aren't getting kind of, I think moving, I don't think we're moving forward talking about our scope. I think I just need to, to rather than a bunch of like, scattered ideas which they're not scattered i mean they they go together but like is this like a parking lot with like you know some landscaping and then some trails i mean i like as a whole i feel like i can't really say participate in this because i'm not really sure i've i've not honestly i've not been up there um a whole lot um I'm not even sure what when I was up there, if, if that's what, the place you were talking about. So I guess I got to go see it. But is that what you're thinking about? Like like a parking space with some plants around it looks really beautiful and then access to trails. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I'm maybe just, not so much parking lot, but I'm just more, trying to get a sense of. Yeah, yeah. What we're talking about here, just a place that you can wander around, a place you can just walk up to and and, and enjoy out. the overlook. Yeah. Can Candace, I'd be happy to take you up there if you want to okay. get together. Okay. Okay, sure. I'd show you around. And and anybody else, you know, we did do a field trip at one time <clears throat> where we all went up there to have a look around. Because there's also a, a, an area that's zone park in front of the storage units also. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, Candace, I think your newness and unfamiliarity with the area is actually, I think brings up a really important part in that right now, as it is, it's kind of an island without any good access. And uh, so thinking about it in terms of how we would wanna activate that space and what it means for access and where that access is coming from, whether it's a destination in and of itself and what kind of amenities that would need versus something that is more of a, um, a transitional space that ties in other amenities like trails uh, and serves other purposes like egress, for example, emergency vehicle access. 
uh, is an important part of the concept. And, and we've had this discussion before, but as it stands right now, unless we think about access, it's just, as I said, it's an island um, with really very little way for people to get there and enjoy it without building a huge parking lot. But, but yeah, but also there, there is that piece that Jen was talking about with OSAC. So I think we, it would be great if we started working with OSAC because they, I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, um, they were talking about developing a, a trail that would basically just follow Serpentine Drive up to Rainbow Falls and then on up to, to the flats, basically. So that would be, you know, another way to access the flats is, is up along Serpentine Drive. And then you can yeah, come down. That would yeah. That would basically be it, but you know that that process hasn't begun yet either, right? Right. Um, so um, that still needs to kick off. Yeah. Plus, I think there's another property owner that owns right next to us. We'd have to talk to her about because we'd be trespassing across her property. So we would have to get some sort of a easement of, of or something from her to be able to get to uh, the flats. All right, so I think we need to, I think we all need to do some homework in terms of reviewing our, our, you know, minutes from prior meetings, the history of the area, as well as the information in the post plan. Uh, I would encourage anybody that hasn't to get up and take a look and get an appreciation for the scope of the place and really think about what we, how we want to um, use the space but also think about the scope in terms of what we can get accomplished in the short term. I do think that this is an important time with the new open space acquisition, uh, because that could be an important piece in terms of how we activate this. But um, uh, it's obviously complicated uh, when you look at the location in terms of, you know, how hard it is to get there as it is right now. So we've got a lot of work to do, even though we've talked about it a bunch before. Uh, what does everybody think about maybe putting this on the agenda the next month, continue our discussion after we get a chance to uh, get everybody up to speed and review? Yeah, that would be okay. Well, great. Yeah, Let's do that. Does anybody have any additional comments uh, or thoughts to help frame our discussion going forward? Just that um, I do like your, you know, the simplicity of your idea of like Overlook Park, like let's just like, if you build it, they will come. Like <laughs> that's all we really need to do is just like build that, you know, simple Overlook Park and then the, the trails and the, all that stuff will kind of, fall into place later I think it'll all work out and um, I do think that the consultation with the um, native community can happen in terms of like yeah like signage and getting there you know um, just so that we don't we just want to like make sure the information that we have is right that we're displaying to the public um, and I think it can be that simple. All right, anybody else? Okay, well, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn our meeting. Oh, wait a minute, Tim? This was the last item, wasn't it? Oh, no, uh, 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 other business. Oh, I'm sorry, Danu, thank you. Other business. Uh, nope. Oh, yeah. Are you still there? Yep. Um, well, Res uh, Daniel Roge is resigning off our board. She's oh. moving away. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks. Sorry, that ended up on the on the second page. I forgot about that. <laughs> oh, so that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. And uh, and then that's it. Then you can go ahead and turn. So yeah. Okay, we're done, eh, Tim? Sounds good to me, unless anybody else has anything.
No, not me. All right, thanks guys. Good night. Thanks.